so beautiful. I love, uh, just love to have children, uh, and uh, it's great to hear the noise of children, you know. Uh, if you're ever in a church where you never hear the noise of children, you're in, it's in a, not a good thing. Um, so, you know, do you guys know that in some parts of the world, people still don't have indoor plumbing? You're aware of that, right? You're, you're, you're aware of the fact that there are places, there are entire nations or at least areas of, within many nations in which not only do the people not have running water, a lot of people don't even have their own well. And in those cultures, in those societies, very often it is the task of the women to make a daily trip down to the community well to get a daily supply of water for their household. When uh, I was growing up, my family lived in Beirut, Lebanon for three and a half years, and man, did I see this scene so many times as we made our way around various villages of Lebanon. And, and so many times I saw uh, women walking down the street carrying this tall pottery jar of water, or maybe it was empty one way or the other, whether they were going to or from the well, but they were carrying these really tall jars of, 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 of water on their heads, usually, is the way they do it. And, um, you know, it's quite an accomplishment, I would think, I would feel, to, to get back to the house with, what, maybe five, six gallons of water that they carried for a mile or two. But they know that they're gonna have to turn around and do it again the very next day, and the next day, and the next, and the next. Every day they have to do this. Now, as foreign as an experience as that is to you and me probably, it's actually something that is indicative of every one of us when it comes to the way that we live out our lives. And I wanna to talk to you about that today. See, as we continue our series, Walking with Jesus today, we're gonna to meet a woman in John chapter four that Jesus met and had a conversation with, a woman whose life was transformed in a very particular way as she encountered Jesus at a well. And I'm really excited to, uh, to walk you through this story today because it's actually one of my favorite stories in the Gospel of John. This woman shows up at the well without very much. No name, no friends, no water, no credentials. She, she's got no place among God's people and she's got no honor among her own. She really doesn't have anything per se except an empty water jar. It's all she's got. Now, John introduced us to her counterpart, Nicodemus, in the previous chapter, John chapter three, which we looked at last week. And he is the, he's like everything she's not. Okay, Nicodemus is the opposite of this woman. He's the clean living guy who's got a good life, who, who's got letters behind his name, who's got the respect of his peers and has made something of himself. And, and so there's some people that will relate more to Nicodemus. And, and maybe that's you, maybe, maybe you feel like, you know, that, I, I feel like I've done pretty good for myself and then you might relate more to Nicodemus. And, and you know what John says to you, if you're one of those type of people, you need Jesus. You need him, and without him, you're perishing. And, and until you let him save you and, and let him make you new by the power of the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit begin to propel you through life, then you're really lost and you're going the wrong direction. But then there's this woman here in chapter four who, who, is, who is really someone that represents the opposite crowd. She, she is the one who represents the powerless, the voiceless. She represents people who, who have maybe not made all the best decisions with their lives. People who have kind of looked back and see a litany of, of failures and who have maybe a checkered past that they're carrying with them. She, she represents people who feel overlooked and rejected and who maybe find themselves looking through the glass from the outside. And to that type of person, if you relate more to her, John says, you know what? You need Jesus. And he's made himself available to you. And he's offering you this same eternal life that he offered to Nicodemus. 
But even though those two characters in John's story contrast, there's something that's really universal about this woman in John chapter four. There's something about her that just is universally relevant, I think. Because even though she was a real person, and this was a real event that happened, in the context of, God, of John's gospel, he sees this woman as an analogy of the human condition. Like she stands for, for all of us here. It's a story about a woman making her daily trip to the well and it's literally dripping with symbolism. And it speaks to this emptiness that, that all of us carry in our hearts through life. And so let's see what John says in verse three and following. He says, so Jesus left Judea and he went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon when a Samaritan woman came to draw water. Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you what? Living water, right? Now, this is such a compelling story because as you look at it deeply, you begin to realize that she's just like the rest of us. We are all trapped in this never ending cycle of trying to satisfy heavenly longings with earthly things. And that's right where she was. Her life was a constant series of trips down to the well with her empty jar to fill it. And you might think to yourself, well, I mean, she had to have water, right? I mean, everybody needs water, right? That makes sense. But you see, Jesus saw her carrying her empty jar to other wells besides this kind of well. And Jesus saw that there were some other areas of her life that she was doing basically the same thing that she was doing on this occasion. So when he talks to her about living water, it's kind of an interesting phrase, right? And when he, when he says that, he is trying to get her to make a connection between her felt need for the water that she had come for and her deeper spiritual need for something that he wanted to give her. And there's at least one other well that she's been going back and forth to trying to, to fill this gnawing need within her. In verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. Interesting thing to say. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. <laughs> now he's got her attention. <laughs> and Jesus is showing that he has a supernatural knowledge of this stranger's life. Like he knows her. He knows everything about her. He, he knows what makes her tick. See, Jesus knows that she goes back and forth to the well of relationships, trying to fill her empty jar with love and companionship and validation, only to find that it, it lasts for a while and then she comes up empty again. And so back to the well she goes, marrying, divorcing, remarrying, divorcing, remarrying and she keeps going back to that same well again and again and again and, and and like so many people probably thinking the next one will be it like this this is the one this time and, and probably attributing her her string of failed marriages to bad luck or to maybe her inability to choose the right person or or, or maybe to 
the fact that she's just kind of come to the conclusion that there are no good men out there. And she's just gonna have to settle for what she can get. But what she doesn't realize is that what's actually driving her is something that's deeper than that. Like there, there's a need in this woman that there's no man, no human being that's gonna fill that need. And she doesn't realize that. She doesn't realize that this is a need that just another romance is not going to quench this thirst, at least not for long. It might for a short time, but pretty soon she's gonna come up dry again and she's gonna be going right back to that same well. And aren't we all pretty much in the same boat? I mean, it might look a little different for you. You might not be going to the same well she's going to, for you, it might not be uh, you know, a, a serial case of, of disposable relationships, but for you, it might be something else. For you, it might be your next big payday. Like you just gotta make more money. You've gotta find a way to, to make some more money. And, and so you're, you're always going back to the well of, of how can I score my next payday? Or maybe for you, you know, it's, it's you know, your, your next shopping excursion. <laughs> it's like, you know, if, if, I, if I get something new, then I'll feel more alive. Or maybe for you, it's, it's going back to, you know, that, that endless string of rendezvous that you have with a substance, whatever that substance is that you use to, to numb yourself. Or maybe it's to pornography so that you can kind of have some sort of escape from your stress or, or from your boredom. Whatever the well is for you that you keep going back to again and again, it always runs dry again, doesn't it? If you notice that, it's like you keep going and then pretty soon, man, you gotta go right back and you gotta go right back. And you just keep doing this again and again and again. You see this unnamed woman in John chapter four, she's not alone. She is humanity always looking for life somewhere, looking for satisfaction somewhere and getting little tastes of it here and there only to pretty soon find that she's coming up dry again. Because guys, there is only one source that actually provides a never ending continuous stream of life. There's only one source that can do that. And it's none of those temporary things that we tend to go after. In verse 10, again, Jesus said, and he answered her, he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. See, it's, it's not what you need, it's who, yes, it's who you need. And, and, and she doesn't get that yet. She's still chasing the shadow of the real thing. And so in the next couple of verses, verses 11 and 12, she, she kind of balks at this whole idea that Jesus could give her something that she can't get for herself. I mean, after all, he doesn't even have a jar. I mean, and what good are you if you don't have a jar? <laughs> I mean, what could he possibly do to help her when he doesn't even have a jar? And not only that, but does, does he really think he's any better than her ancestors who built this well? She's wondering, you know, and, and who, who provided it for her. And, 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 you know, if Jesus is offering her something that her parents didn't need and her grandparents didn't need and, and something that's different than her family background that she is used to, then she's not interested. I mean, who does he think he is anyway that he's trying to, to offer her something that's better than the world that she grew up in and that she's accustomed to. And his answer resonates, I think, in our thirsty souls, verse 13 and 14. Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be what? Thirsty again, yes. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus didn't have a jar because he didn't need a jar. And you don't have to keep living out your existence 
with these endless trips back to the wells of the world that only satisfy for a very short time, and then you have to go back and do it all over again. Jesus says, no, if you'll allow me, if you will let me in, he says, then my love for you and, and, and the eternal life I wanna give you is going to satisfy you always. It's gonna be something that you're not gonna have to, to go get more of it. It's gonna be there. And instead of running out on you, he says, it's gonna actually well up within you. It's gonna be like this spring that just keeps bubbling and just keeps, keeps pouring out this refreshment for your soul. And you see, that's what walking with Jesus does for you. Walking with Jesus is about letting him become that spring of water that waters your soul. Letting him become the source that, that waters your, your soul and satisfies you at a core level. Because if, you're, if your core is being well watered, then guess what? Everything else about your life is gonna grow and flourish. But if your core isn't well watered, if your core is dry and cracking, like the ground's gonna be come late July, then no matter how good the other parts of your life might look momentarily, they're all gonna end up proving to be a wasteland at some point. And Jesus is wanting her to do two things. Did you notice in verse 10, the two things he wanted her to do? He wants her to number one, recognize who he is. And number two, ask him for the living water that he's offering her. Well, at first she doesn't understand who he is. And when she asks him to give her that living water, she's still thinking Aquafina, you know? She's looking around for the sparkless truck to come make deliveries to her house. And, and so he shifts her focus here towards her endless thirst for relationships and the series of broken marriages in her life and, and this current thing she's got going with this guy that she's not even married to because she probably has decided that they're just gonna leave her anyway, so why get married and I'll just, I'll just live with him this time. Don't you hate it when Jesus gets personal? <laughs> when Jesus starts getting personal, that's when it gets uncomfortable, right? And I think she doesn't much like the probing that he's doing at this point. And so she does what we often do. She starts a who's right argument. Verse 19, sir, the woman said, I can see you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place we must worship is in Jerusalem. Like, wait, who are you to talk to me about my live-in? You guys don't even worship in the right church building. See, it's always easier to argue about religion or to argue about who's right on this issue or that issue than to face up with our own issues, with our own brokenness within. And, 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 and that's exactly, I think, what's happening here. And, and Jesus graciously goes there with her but only long enough to help her to understand that, that true worship is something that now under the new covenant does not depend on the location, but depends on the spirit of the worshiper connecting with the spirit of God. It, that, that true worship is something that requires a, a, a true understanding of who this God is that we worship. And, and, and after well, as he says that, it's important because until we see that, until we see that God is who he is and understand him to be what he is, then we're gonna keep going back to those wells. We're gonna keep chasing that thing that we think is gonna satisfy us, that's really an idol. And we're gonna keep going back to the, to the wells of the world. And so he, he says, no, look, you need to understand who God really is. And then with that, he leads her to open up and express a hope that maybe she hadn't expressed in years, who knows? Verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And when he comes, he will explain everything to us. And guys, that's exactly where he wanted her to go. That's exactly where he wanted this woman to go. He wanted her to, to move beyond the well and beyond the, her arguments about religion and beyond 
her series of failed marriages to him. That's where he wanted her attention to be, on him. That's the climax of the conversation in verse 26 when Jesus declares to her, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Jesus is saying, I, I'm the one that you've been looking for, even when you didn't know it. I'm the one that you've been waiting for. I'm the one who can satisfy your deepest needs. It's not out there somewhere. It's right here in front of you. And that's what he's saying to you. That's what he's saying to me too. And there's this wonderfully significant detail that John includes as he describes this scene here. The other disciples might have missed this detail, but not John. He's just the kind of guy that notices these things. In verse 28, it says, Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? See, the, the camera follows the woman as she hurries away down the path back towards the town. And then it slowly pans back to the well and zooms in on her abandoned water jar. Things are gonna be different for her from now on. She, she has left behind this jar and is now intent on, on finding a different kind of water, one that doesn't require a jar to carry. She, she's, she's decided she's no longer gonna keep running to the well of relationships that keeps running dry on her. And now instead, she's intent on a new kind of relationship, a relationship with God that's gonna be this spring of water that's gonna be bubbling up inside of her all the time and she doesn't have to have a jar to go get some more of it when it runs out. See, this is an incredibly important moment in this woman's life. And it turns out, as you read on in the story, that she's not the only one who's been doing this. She's not the only one that's been running back and forth, trying to fill heavenly longings with earthly things. Because when they first arrived, Jesus' disciples had gone into the town to buy food. And uh, just as Jesus' conversation with this woman is wrapping up, they show back up at the well with their Chick-fil-A. I mean, don't you figure Jesus' apostles must have eaten Chris, Christian ch chicken, right? You know, if I could spit it out. Um, but so they show up with their Chick-fil-A at the, at the well, and, and they're very stunned to find that Jesus is talking with this Samaritan woman. Because, I mean, he is breaking several very deep-seated cultural norms here. I mean, first of all, Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Secondly, Jewish men, particularly rabbis, didn't have conversations with women they didn't know in public. Third, she clearly was a social outcast because she was at the well at noon at a time when none of the other women would have been there. And, and so Jesus is, is, he's breaking some norms and they're, they're very surprised to find him having this conversation. So they just kind of sit there and watch until she heads back off into town. And then verse 31 says that meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. See, this is such a strikingly similar conversation to the one he just had with this outcast woman about water, but this time it's with his own disciples and it's about food. But it's really the same conversation. See, they were hungry and they wanted some food to quiet their empty stomachs. And that's fine, that, that's great. But the thing is, they're gonna be hungry again soon and they're gonna have to go get more food. And they're in the process so preoccupied with the food that they went and got that they're missing the food that Jesus wants them to have. They're so preoccupied with the food 
that will fill their bellies that they're missing out on the food that would fill their souls. <laughs> See, there is a harvest of food to be gathered and to be enjoyed right there and right then. And Jesus is enjoying it. He is feasting on this food right now. So I'm sure that Jesus' stomach was still growling. But what he is experiencing, what he's taking in right now is filling him up in ways that no chicken sandwich ever will. He's helping a woman who was hardened because of her emotional wounds to find hope again. He's helping a person who felt alienated to feel valued again. He's helping an individual who is weary of her constant trips to the wells of the world to receive eternal life. She had come to the well thirsty, but now she had something a lot more than water on her mind. And she was headed back into the town with a refreshment happening in her soul that she hadn't experienced maybe ever and she is heading back into the town and this is such a cool thing happening to her that she just wants to like share it. She just wants to tell everybody else about it and get them to come check out Jesus for themselves. And guess what? They're coming. They're coming. They wanna check out Jesus for themselves. And so they're, they're, they're on their way with her back to, to see him. And, and Jesus says in verse 35 to his disciples, do you not have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. And that's what happens when you're walking with Jesus. Jesus opens your eyes to the living water and to the spiritual food that's there for you to feast on, that's there for you to, to find life in, that's there for you to enjoy and to find satisfaction in and to share with others. It's, it's this incredible thing that we otherwise completely miss out on and we overlook it. See, Jesus wants you to discover that, and he wants me to discover that, that life isn't just about filling the cravings of your body. It's about filling the needs of your soul. It's about something so much deeper. So let me ask you, what well have you been running back and forth to trying to find something that will satisfy you that only leaves you dry and back you come again? What is it that you have been craving that as you feed yourself on that thing only satisfies you for a few hours and then you're hungry again. Because I think our next step is to make sure that you're going to the right well. Make sure you're going to the right well. How about this? How about this week when you start to find yourself running back to that same old craving that you always run to? What if instead, you, when you notice that, you would turn your attention to the living water that Jesus has offered you and just go and, 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 and enjoy that? In, instead of going back to that same old well, what if you intentionally said, no, I'm not gonna do that. Instead, I'm going to go to Jesus and I'm gonna spend some time with him. I, I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna talk to him I'm gonna to listen to his voice. I'm gonna put on some worship music and I'm gonna worship him and I'm gonna remember how good he is. I'm gonna open my Bible and, and I'm gonna to listen to what, his word to me and let it fill me and let it remind me of what's really important and everything that it's actually of, sub, of substance and has something that will feed me and, and give me something that will nourish my soul. So what if we would do that this week? Just give Jesus the chance to actually meet the deeper need that's behind or underneath the need you're feeling. And look to the harvest this week. Look to the harvest that's all around you in the form of people. 
because it's there and it's ripe and it's just waiting for you and me to step into that. Why not just this week rediscover how serving someone or, or sharing Jesus with someone is the best and most satisfying meal that you've had in a long time. Let's pray together. The wells of this world, Jesus, are plentiful. They're all around us. So many different wells that we can go to. And I know you look at us and you see us hauling that empty jar around all the time. And you wonder when we're gonna set it down and come to you for the living water that won't run out the living water that comes from a relationship with you please Jesus open our eyes open our eyes that we may see the truth of what we've been going after and that we would have the humility to say Jesus I realize that that's the wrong thing and I need to go to you Help us to believe that you'll actually fill that need, Lord, because that, I think, is our biggest problem, is that we don't think you will. So I pray, God, that you would give us the spiritual eyes to believe that when you say that you will fill that need, that you will give us the spring of water within us that will refresh us, that will give us a sense of well-being and a sense of of stability and growth and that and, and will help us flourish in every area of our lives, Lord, that we would believe you and we would go to you. Forgive us for the many times we have not. But Lord, help us to make a, a new decision today. Today, this week, is gonna be different. And we're gonna abandon our jars at the well and we're gonna come to the living spring. We pray. 